Colorado Democrats get in line fast behind Kamala Harris for president, the governor giving the best possible answer about whether he will be her VP pick. This means that the Coloradans who voted in the Democratic presidential primary will not pick the candidate. We're talking to the people who will pick in their place. It's not difficult, but it is definitely confusing. Denver's mayor looks back on one year in office with a pivot to new priorities and a gathering of aviation pioneers. They didn't blaze a trail in the skies for nothing. They're making sure that young Coloradans follow. That's tonight on Next. It's another Monday where we gather back here together and the world is not as we left it on Friday. President Joe Biden clung tightly to the metaphorical torch for weeks before not just passing it, but practically tossing it to Vice President Kamala Harris, who caught it running and immediately got the endorsement of every Colorado Democrat in Congress. Harris is already working to lock in the commitments of the Democratic delegates going to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, including 87 Coloradans. Next, it's going to go on the road. You should come along with us. The Associated Press is reporting today that as of now, Harris has more than 1,100 delegates locked in. She needs more than 1,900 to become the party's nominee. It appears likely she'll get them because party leaders are racing to get behind her and no serious challenger has emerged. Along with all seven of Colorado's congressional Democrats who have backed Harris's young campaign, so have the Democratic Party chairs in all 50 states. Members of Colorado's delegation told us today that they think there should be an open process for the nomination in case somebody else does step up. But they noted that Harris already has strong support from voters as part of that Biden-Harris ticket. The primaries and caucuses that we just had throughout the country, the Biden-Harris ticket was was selected by over 80 percent of the primary voters. And so uh, already she has had a, a strong support across the country. I endorsed and continue to support uh, Vice President Harris because I think she's the best. But I fully support an open process and other people getting coming forward. And it, it, this shouldn't be decided by uh, a, a number of endorsements or back room discussions. When they talk about being in an echo chamber, that's what they're talking about. There have been reports that Democrat turned independent Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia might consider re-registering as a Democrat to challenge Harris. But if you're thinking, do Democrats want to nominate someone who just recently did not want to be a Democrat? Yeah, me too. President Biden won Colorado's presidential primary in March. Democratic and unaffiliated voters chose him to be the Democratic nominee. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger explains how Colorado's Democratic delegates will now make a different decision without voter approval. So, dear delegate, I know you have before you... The campaigning to earn Democratic delegate support is underway. The proof is in the email sent to delegates, like Jefferson County Commissioner Tracy Kraft Tharp. It's from Marianne. Marianne Williamson. No, I have not seen that email, um, but there is zero to no chance that um, I would consider Marianne Williamson uh, for my delegate vote. Wanda James, a CU regent and pot business pioneer, is also one of Colorado's 72 Democratic delegates who will select the Democratic nominee for president, though her choice is not a secret. It's written on the wall behind her. That's me, my husband, and, and Kamala, actually here in my office. Um, we were standing right back here in, uh, in my home office. James and Kraft Tharp were picked as delegates by going through the caucus assembly and convention process. It's not difficult, but it is definitely confusing. Those meetings happened virtually this year, but they often take place in school classrooms and auditoriums. So when voters selected President Biden as Colorado's Democratic presidential primary winner, they were really telling the Colorado Democratic Party to select delegates who support Biden. You're voting for people like me. Kraft Tharp campaigned to be picked as a Biden delegate, kind of like she was running for office. And now she can pick whomever she wants as a presidential nominee. There's going to be a number of people that are going to put their names up. And as a delegate, yeah, I get to make that decision. She'll be picking Harris, like Wanda James. All 72 Colorado delegates, picked because they were Biden supporters, can do what they want without any more guidance from Colorado voters. Even being uh, elected as regent, um, clearly, we don't take every vote that I make as regent. We don't put that up for a vote of the people to make sure that I am doing exactly what everybody in the district or the majority of the people in the district would want me to do. This delegate process is kind of like the November presidential election, where the state's decision 
is really picking 10 electors that support that decision. So if the Democratic nominee were to win Colorado in November, it means that the 10 electors that the Colorado Democratic Party pick will cast Colorado's electoral college votes for that candidate. And if former President Trump were to win Colorado, that the 10 electors the Colorado Republican Party pick will cast the state's electoral college votes for Trump. Same process. I keep looking around and listening for Colorado Democrats who are outraged about the elites or the donors picking Harris and, and them wanting something different. All I see are Colorado Republicans telling Democrats that they should be mad, but I don't hear it from Democrats. No, and I think I have one viewer email that basically was like, what's this process? Why don't voters get a say? Who are these delegates? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what this story goes to. But no, I have not heard from Democrats that say, I don't like this. How come it's going this way? Yeah, well, if you're a Colorado Democrat, you're mad about this. Email Marshall. You, you can email <laughs> me too, but email Marshall first. Thank you. So Kamala Harris has less than a month to find a potential running mate before the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. And cheers to Colorado's Democratic Governor Jared Polis, who is not likely to win that nod, but did win the self-awareness Olympics with this response when he was asked about it by CNN. Obviously, if, if somebody asks, I take a serious look at it, but uh, my phone hasn't rung yet. Look, if they, if they do the polling and it turns out that they need a 49-year-old balding gay Jew from Boulder, Colorado, they got my number. <laughs> Marshall has asked me to fact check whether the governor is balding or bald, but I'm going to let those two men sort it out themselves. He's still standing here. So. Uh, Polis has long insisted that he does not want to run for president in the way that people who really, really want to run for president insist that they don't want to run for president. Polis quickly endorsed Harris right after Biden's exit yesterday. Polis had expressed some concerns about Biden's campaign, but never straight up said that he should drop out. And yesterday, Polis said that Biden had made the right choice. So it didn't take long after Harris announced her campaign for the far right to start recycling a debunked racist conspiracy theory that Harris is not eligible for office because her parents were immigrants at the time that she was born in California. Like so much of the conspiratorial brain rot these days, this birtherism against Kamala Harris appears to have come out of Colorado. John Eastman was a visiting scholar at CU when Harris was named Biden's running mate in 2020. Eastman, of course, went on to design Donald Trump's plan to overthrow American democracy and stay in power. Eastman is currently an attorney for the Colorado Republican Party. Back in 2020, he wrote an essay for Newsweek where he questioned whether Harris, who was born in Oakland to Jamaican and Indian immigrants, could serve as vice president because of some legal arguments over the definition of natural born citizen. The essay was so immediately and widely discredited by basically every other legal scholar that Newsweek had to add a, an editor's note distancing itself from Eastman's theory. But the claim was still amplified by Donald Trump. Eastman is currently clinging to his ability to practice law because he's had his law license suspended for the time being in Washington, D.C. and in California. Nearly all the words that could be said about President Biden's decision to withdraw from the race have been said in the last 24 hours. I just add this through the lens of politics here in Colorado. President Biden's decision to withdraw rather than to accept near certain defeat at the hands of a rival that he describes as a threat to American democracy, that is action that is in line with the weight of his words. I've been critical of some Colorado Democrats here because for two elections in a row, they have said that election deniers are a threat to democracy. Then those same Democrats spend money to boost election deniers in GOP primaries because the Democrats think that those folks would be easier to beat. It casts doubt on whether they truly believe their own words about the danger posed by people who would try to overturn or deny elections to hold power. Whatever you think of President Joe Biden, whatever you think of his politics, whether or not you even agree with his assessment of what a Donald Trump presidency would mean, judge solely through that lens of do the actions match the words. President Biden's decision to step aside meets his definition of what is on the line this year. Everything. Denver Mayor Mike Johnson marked a year in office with a State of the City address celebrating progress that's been made on housing the homeless and migrants and then quickly turning to broader affordable housing and public safety projects. Our Angeline McCall has that. As Mayor Johnston enters his second year in office, new programs mean a new look in downtown Denver. When you make that walk today, you will not see a single tent or a single encampment in all of downtown Denver. Critics say Mayor Johnston has focused too much on one issue, homelessness. He says that's translated, though, into 1,600 people moved off the streets. Because those people who are living on the streets are now living indoors in dignity. 
A dream that seemed impossible a year ago, that we could find a path to end street homelessness in the next four years, now feels more possible than ever. To execute, Johnson has spent $155 million, $65 million more than what he said it would cost last year. In this budget year, we knew we were going to spend more because this year we were building all the infrastructure to run our homeless program long term. We bought hotels, we built tiny home villages. That comes at a cost. Cost. In just a few months, Johnson will ask voters to raise the city's sales tax by 0.5% to create affordable housing. So the reason why we're coming to the voters is to solve the affordable housing need, given how fast this city's growing, we're going to need more resources to hit a goal that's twice as ambitious as what we're hitting now. His first year will shape now the second, with more to do to increase the number of units for affordable housing to solve the ongoing homelessness crisis and focus on safety in the city. But if there is one thing we've learned in the past year, it is that the single hardest problem we will ever face is the belief that we can't solve these problems at all. In his speech, the mayor said this historic effort has not been without mistakes. We asked him what those mistakes are. He said if he could do it all again, he would offer better case management and support for the House 1000 sites. He also said that he would add more safety protections and screening for people entering those shelters. I mean, that's a pretty fair assessment, right? That, those are things that both you and our Mark Salinger have reported on extensively over the last couple of weeks in terms of snags in the process. Right. We know that there have been several deaths within these shelters. And ultimately, you know, that was one of my questions that I asked the mayor, right? Uh, you know, you want to put more money and more funding and more resources into homelessness and affordable housing. But how do you keep these types of sites safe? And so this is kind of one thing on reflection he said he would do differently. And I misspoke there. I should have said that was reporting over months not weeks. Angeline, thank you very much. And thank you for your latest weekly generosity. Your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign, between the one-time gifts and the monthly donations, it's raised about $30,000 for Just Living Recovery. It's a nonprofit sober living community designed for the LGBTQ community. Through 214 weeks of giving, 214 weeks, you've raised just shy of $13 million for Colorado's nonprofits. That is a powerful force for good in our community that you just built out of nowhere and it rolls on. So if you know of a group that could use our help, email me next at 9news.com. It's just part of farming, which is a bummer. Weekend hailstorm decimates months of work in just minutes. And we'll introduce you to a Colorado on a mission to celebrate black aviation pioneers, past and future. A federal judge has given a church in Castle Rock the green light to continue to shelter people on their property for the time being. The church is suing the town of Castle Rock, saying that zoning regulations infringe on their religious views. The Rock Church is suing so they can continue to offer temporary shelter in two RVs parked in their lot. The town of Castle Rock ordered the program closed, said the only shelter a church is allowed to provide on its property is a parsonage. Church's lawsuit claims that's a violation of federal prohibitions on land use regulations that would interfere with religious beliefs. Namely, they say God is calling the church to house the homeless, and this is how they can do it. Earlier this month, the judge questioned whether that argument might open the floodgates for churches to ignore zoning rules and develop their properties. But the judge is allowing the case to move forward, allowing the church to keep the RV shelters going in the meantime. The hail and the nasty storms over the weekend were a nuisance for a lot of us, but for some farmers up in northern Colorado, they just got wiped out. This is a huge, huge loss for us. Like this, we have about 300 acres of barley this year that was planted, so this is a 70 acre field. I don't want people to feel sorry for me because there's lots of other farmers that are either getting it worse than we have. Hail took out more than 500 acres at Root Shoot Malting and Berthet in Loveland. Decimated corn stalks and alfalfa and barley. Don't pour one out for them because the last thing we can afford to do now is waste precious beer because Root Shoot is the malt house that provides the malt for craft breweries across Colorado. The owners think they lost about half a million dollars worth of crops. Insurance is going to cover some of that, they say, not all of it. They have about a year and a half worth of barley and grain bins now, so they don't think that it is going to affect local brewery supplies, at least not immediately. On a local level, Kathy, some of those were really ugly storms. That one particular storm we were tracking coming out of Fort Collins dropping south, and it dropped one-inch diameter hail across about seven communities and still tallying the damage today. A much calmer day in terms of severe weather, but poor air quality as wildfire smoke from Canadian wildfires and wildfires in the Pacific Northwest settling into Colorado. High levels of ozone as well, so that air quality alert will be extended out through tomorrow ahead of a hot, dry 
weather trend that'll see us back in the 90s. So with 80s this afternoon, probably the coolest day of the week. East to northeast winds driving that smoke and haze right back into the urban corridor. It's coming in over the top of the high pressure ridge. We will see some improvement tomorrow afternoon into Wednesday, but this air quality alert will remain in effect. So those in the sensitive groups, probably best just to stay indoors. Tracking a couple of showers moving from north to south tonight, uh, mainly over elevated terrain. I don't know that we're going to get that moisture here in Denver. Those storms move out by about 8, 9 o'clock tonight. We have a hot, dry day coming up tomorrow. Temperature is very comfortable over the next couple of hours, but we're looking at a warming trend that will see us at 90 on Tuesday, mid-90s for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Total of uh, African-American astronauts is only about 19 to 20 of them. Small club, but certainly an important one for American history, bringing black aviation pioneers together under one roof. Next. The names of America's black astronauts are not known by very many people. There's a group in Denver trying to change that. The nonprofit Shades of Blue is planning a reunion of black space pioneers with an eye to the future, not just the past. Here's some photos that you might find interesting. These were uh, several of the astronauts here. My name is Captain Willie L. Daniels II, and I'm the president and founder of Shades of Blue. This celebration is an opportunity to uh, honor our nation's heroes. Uh, Dr. Guyon Bluford, Ron McNair, Colonel Fred Gregory, and General Charlie Bolden. Those were the first uh, four African-American astronauts. We have uh, several astronauts of color uh, that most people have never seen before. Astronaut Alvin Drew. And this is part of the ongoing effort of Shades of Blue to reach our nation's youth to help inspire them to become pilots, engineers, scientists. We have uh, astronaut uh, Leland Melvin. For our young people who or coming up in elementary, middle, high school, uh, how do they inspire to become an astronaut when they have never seen one before? Or they don't know we even do those types of jobs. We've only had roughly about three, three to 400 people actually leave the Earth and, and travel up above the Kármán line, which is about uh, 330,000 feet. Total of uh, African-American astronauts is only about 19 to 20 of them. Having passed over 330,000 feet. They are uh, like with uh, Ed DeWight, even after being uh, pushed aside in 1963 after the Kennedy assassination, he never stopped dreaming of the possibility of one day getting into space. It, it symbolizes that never give up on your dreams. Always, always reach for the stars and, and never stop until you achieve what your goals are. I feel that God has put me in a position to be able to recognize these folks, and I have to take advantage of that opportunity while it's there, because I feel if, if I don't do it, uh, who else will do it? Well, thanks to Byron Reed for that story. We are back with your feedback next. Thank you. Eric says, I don't understand why you prefaced your Biden commentary with sideways knocks at Colorado's Democratic leaders. Because, Eric, I, I think that the honesty of Biden's approach in dropping out of the race and being true to how he's described the stakes is at odds with what we've seen from Colorado's Democratic leadership. And I, I try to offer you a local perspective here, right? You don't need me to repeat the news and views that you've heard from national media outlets any more than you need me to report the same old news stories that are on every single other newscast on every single other channel. We're trying to provide you something that hopefully is both insightful and somewhat unique. Appreciate everybody who wrote in for and against the beard going. I'll pass it along to the people who make the decisions.